your mother Green lady, we're covering today's top box of news Okay, we'll start with this. June 17th just got a little bigger. British Boxer of the Year, Natasha Jonas, defends her WBC, WBO, IBF, and Ring Magazine Super Welterweight titles, while Mark Heffron puts his British Super Middleweight Championship on the line against Zach Chelly in a hugely anticipated domestic clash. It's hard to imagine that Natasha Jonas's next opponent will be a high-profile opponent. It's good that they were able to get Natasha Jonas on this card, but I think the fight is going to be a, a maintenance fight, a tickover fight. It's not going to be a high-profile fight with a high-profile opponent because all the high-profile opponents at or around this weight they're spoken for. Terry Harper, the only other champion at 154 pounds. She's going to be fighting Cecilia Brakus. Clarissa Shields, she very recently announced she's going to be fighting Hannah Gabriels for a second time. Jessica McCaskill, she's got a mandatory challenge that is satisfied downstairs at Welterweight. There are not that many high-profile fighters anywhere at or around 154 pounds. The fighters that do have a profile, they're all spoken for. So I don't imagine that Natasha's next fight is going to be a high profile fight with a high profile fighter. It's just going to be a run out. Which isn't bad. The least they can do is get Natasha Jonas a fight, even if it is just a, a maintenance fight. I'm a very big fan of Natasha Jonas. It's a great human interest story. Years ago, when she suffered that shock upset loss to Vivian Obanoff, no one would have thought that Natasha Jonas would go on to become a champion, let alone a unified champion, many divisions north, several. North of super featherweight. Natasha Jonas really managed to turn things around gradually. Many counted her out ahead of what was the Terry Harper fight. Most didn't anticipate that she would be able to put up the fight and put on the fight that she put on. It was an excellent fucking fight. Of course, Natasha Jonas is an excellent fucking fighter. That's what she is. At this age, and where she is right now in her professional boxing career, I anticipate that this could very well be Natasha Jonas's last year in the sport of boxing. She had a very big year last year, and she's set to have a run-out fight. Maintenance fight. She picked up three alphabet titles last year. And this will be her first fight this year. I think it's a warm-up fight. I think that Natasha boxer Ben Shalom, they may try to cap off the year with a big fight, a bigger fight than this upcoming fight, and this is just a prelude. The question is, who could Natasha Jonas end up facing later on this year that makes for a big fight? I'm not completely sure it would be Clarissa Shields, because I vaguely recall hearing something about Clarissa returning to the PFL later on this year. I remember hearing something about that last year. We know she's going to fight Hannah Gabriel, so that would presumably take place after that, after that fight. I don't think it'll be Clarissa, and I don't think it'll be Jessica McCaskill either. If Jessica McCaskill ends up beating Ivana Habazin, her mandatory challenger, in all likelihood, she's gonna go straight into a unification match with Sandy Ryan, newly crowned WBO champion. That if Natasha wins her next fight, and she's looking to have a bigger fight after that later on this year, I don't think it's gonna be Clarissa. Nope. I don't think it's gonna be Jessica. Nope. And that leaves only Terry Harper. Natasha is successful in June. Will she finally come around to the idea of boxing Terry Harper for a second time for what now is the undisputed junior middleweight championship? Would that be an idea that she's receptive to later on this year? There aren't that many big fights to make. There aren't that many names, big ones, at or around these weights. The further up you go in women's boxing, the more shallow the talent pool becomes to where the big names, the credible ones, they really can't afford to ignore each other. That's why you got a great fight, an excellent fight, like Marshall versus Cruz Desern in a jiffy. After one big fight, here comes another. She fought Clarissa, which was a very big fight. Now she's fighting Franchon. What is another big fight? Another undisputed championship. The addition of Natasha Jonas to this show makes it that much more interesting and what already was a pretty solid card in the co-main event. You have Savannah Marshall versus Franchon Cruz. In the main event, you have Eubank, Chris Eubank, attempting to avenge the loss, the upset loss, to Liam Smith. It's a good card. I like it. I like Natasha Jonas. Not going to apologize for that. She's hot. She's an excellent boxer. I imagine that her next opponent won't be a high-profile opponent. Maybe somebody hanging around 154. Maybe somebody south of 154 at 147. Somebody they can bring up. This is a maintenance fight. A keep-busy fight. That's how it reads. We'll see who Natasha ends up keeping busy with in June. 
In men's super lightweight news, ahead of what's supposed to be his upcoming title fight with Josh Taylor, Teofimo Lopez rails against the SPN commentators, accusing Top Rank of preferring black fighters. And not that long ago, it was Terrence Crawford accusing them of the opposite. Saying they don't promote black fighters, so which one is it? My previous video, we talked about Teofimo Lopez's situation, the emotional outburst he's having, and why it's happening. At least how he got there. But the other angle of it is, Teofimo's choice of words. I mean, what do black fighters have to do with anything? Pertaining to you. It is true that Top Rank is pushing and promoting a good number of black fighters. Fighters like Jared Anderson and Keyshawn and Kelvin Davis, yeah. Shushu Carrington. Tiger Johnson. They are. But they're not doing anything for those fighters that they didn't already do for you. When they were pushing and promoting you. The part Teofimo Lopez likes to leave out is that he lost to George Campos and he didn't look good with Sandor Martin. There were a lot of people that felt he lost that fight. And after the fight, he himself was seen on camera asking himself if he's, he's still, still got it. So that he could turn around weeks and months later and pretend that it was a good showing, a dominant showing. He's not right in the head. In my previous video, we talked about how he doesn't take ownership for anything that happens. He doesn't take ownership for any of the decisions that he's made that led him to this point. And what's so wrong what? about this point? These guys got your title shot, and they set it up to where it's in your neck of the woods, not his. You ain't got to go out to Scotland. He's coming to you. Are you complaining? Teofimo Lopez said, and just to put it on the spot, this is my last fight on ESPN. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. This is why this fight with Josh Taylor means everything to me. If they want the black fighters, they can keep them. I brought Bud Light to top rank. There's no reason to have brought up the color of those fighters' skin. As if to say that a black fighter couldn't have brought Bud Light to ESPN. I mean, what are you implying? What are you saying? That it's either they promote you, the Latino fighter, or they promote them, the black fighters? Huh? Why can't they just do both? That is what they're doing, you know. In response to the backlash, Lopez's father, Teofimo Lopez Sr., went on another outlet to defend his son repeatedly insisting that his son was not a bigot lopez senior said his son is simply frustrated by the fact that he feels his promoter is not prioritizing him in the same way that other fighters in their stable many of whom happen to be black so let me see if i understand this you're frustrated with top rank and you decide to make it a race politics issue what does race have to do with anything that's a question that only lopez jr can answer but that's a question his father attempted to saying when my son said top rank can stay with all their black fighters because you know what it is no. when Devin Haney came into top rank and all this they're promoting him more than they're promoting my son and he feels a little type of way Lopez senior told Mill City Boxing you've got to understand this we're fighting the top dude and we've got to get some respect for that and he just feels some type of way like oh they just want to promote the black fighters you got Keyshawn Davis Shakur Stevenson you've got Jared Anderson now tell me which one of those black fighters tried to backdoor top rank the same way you did which one Which? you talk about Devin Haney and the reason they're pushing and promoting Devin Haney is because he beat the guy that beat you he did it twice on foreign soil he's got a big fight coming up with Vasil Lomachenko a pay-per-view and you're wondering why they're pushing and promoting him you made it about race not them Lopez senior continued so you have all these fighters from top rank that are getting more recognition than my son is getting and he's trying to fight the top dogs. So I gotta do it, race. So that's just something that he had inside. Inside. That he's not inside. being promoted, inside. being appreciated about what he's doing, bro. Well, he can feel like he's being underappreciated. He can feel like he's not being promoted properly, though the reason he's giving. What exactly are you trying to imply? Ah! That top rank puts Latino fighters on the back burner? What about Xander Zayas? They spend a lot of time promoting Xander Zayas. They spend a lot of time promoting Nico Ali Walsh, who's biracial. Seems to me that your problem isn't the color of someone else's skin or yours, you're just making it about that because you don't want to take ownership. You fucked up. Like this fight with Josh Taylor, they're putting him in a fucking Hulu theater, bro. Like for real, bro. I mean, this is the fight that's going to put him in the Hall of Fame. This is a big fight and nobody. The Lopez's have a bad fucking habit of getting a big head. Nobody is even mentioning it, bro. So that's why he's like that. He's got a lot of shit in his fucking chest. Still no excuse. A lot of people are going to try to put this shit like he's racist, bro. My son-in-law is black. You understand? My daughter got married to a black dude, bro. I love black people. We all love black people. 
We was raised with black people, bro. I lived in the projects, bro. bro. I don't even got to explain myself because it's stupid. Bro. Lopez Senior said his son bro. was aware that he made a mistake and that he has urged him to make a formal apology through the media. Good luck with that. My son understood that he was wrong with what he said, Lopez Senior said. But it was nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with that. You can't mention the word black nowadays because everybody gets offended. What you said was offensive. You made it an either or situation for top rank. Sounds a lot like what you're saying is that they can't promote a Latino fighter and a black fighter at the same time. I mean, is that what you're implying? He's the one that said they can keep their black fighters because he's leaving. It's what he said. Lopez Sr. continued, it's a word you cannot use. And I told him, you've got to talk to the media, apologize and let them know that you didn't have no racist intent. Like he didn't say it like in a racist way, bro. He just said it like top rank is really just focusing on the black fighters because it's the market, the marketing strategy. They see that's what people want to see. They love black fighters. I mean, they the best at what they do. You know, black people are fucking very athletic, bro. Nobody can beat them. And I can understand that. I understand that you're trying to run interference. I understand the implications of what your son said. That he is frustrated. He feels like Top Rank isn't pushing him as hard as some other fighters. And his reasoning is... It's a race thing? That's an insight into Teofimo Lopez's mind. As taboo as that might sound, that's an insight into who he he is underneath it all and how he thinks how he really thinks and while his father may have more situational awareness than he does the damage is done people are gonna think what they're gonna think irrespective of what you say and how many times you apologize because what you are saying is that top rank is putting you on the back burner on the premise of race that's what you're saying and if we give this situation a closer look that's not true that's not what's going on what's going on is you've got a big fucking head you think you're supposed to play the big room at madison square garden when neither you or josh taylor are all that big a draw in new york city so you're fighting at the hulu theater what's the problem you ought to be happy they orchestrated it to where it's even at the hulu theater because you're not the champion he is! Gets beat by a Greek guy, dropped two times by a Spaniard. Now he's fighting a Scotsman and he thinks black fighters are his problem. This guy's not right in the head. In reference to that fight, Josh Taylor, Josh Taylor himself still views himself as an undisputed champion. I'm still the man at 140 pounds. He ain't got all the belts, but in some ways he's right. He still is the man to beat at this weight. He is still this division's lineal champion. To me personally, yes, said Taylor to BoxingScene.com when asked if he still believes he should be viewed as an undisputed champion, I haven't lost the belts. Obviously, I was doing a rematch with Jack Catterall, but what got in the way of that was all the mandatories and stuff, so I let go of a couple of belts. Really, they're still my belts. There's other champions at the weight, but they're not really champions. Regardless of forfeiting the majority of his titles, Taylor was unable to land an immediate rematch with Jack Cataract. Now, oh, his rival oh, is behind oh, him. Oh. Taylor is set to return to the ring on June 10th against Teofima Lopez. And you have to wonder how that's gonna go because Josh Taylor, while he hasn't stayed in character, he hasn't looked himself, at least not in his last fight, look at Teofimo. Neither guy looked good in their last fight, but I'd wager that Josh Taylor is in a better headspace than Teofimo, as Teofimo has this latest storm to weather, to endure. I have it on good authority that Regis Progray this past Monday met up with the people over there at Top Rank, and they made him an offer to bring him over. Something to think about ahead of this upcoming Taylor versus Lopez fight, that if Josh Taylor remains this division's Ring Magazine, WBO, and Lineal Champion, maybe he can run it back with Regis if Regis ends up signing the top rank. Maybe. Those are the champions at this weight. They don't have the same recognition that Josh Taylor does, Alberto Puello, Subriel Matias. The only one that does is Regis, and that's because when Regis and Josh first met, they gave each other all they could handle. It was a very close and competitive fight, whereas Alberto... Regis Progre very recently became a two-time super lightweight champion. Yeah. Whereas Alberto Puello, he only got the belt because Josh chucked it. He didn't win it in a high-profile fight. The same applies to Subriel Matias, capable and dangerous fighter that he might be. He only got that title because, once again, again? Josh Taylor chucked it. He won it, won the vacant title opposite the ring Jeremiah's Ponce in what was a very entertaining fight albeit a low-profile fight. Most people aren't familiar with Jeremiah's Ponce. Most people aren't familiar with Subriel Matias. But they are getting there. 
and that's worth mentioning. Josh Taylor, Regis Progray, and Teofimo Lopez. These are three of the more notoriable names in today's super lightweight division, and in many ways, yes, Josh Taylor is still the man to beat. If he does end up beating Teofimo Lopez, I imagine that his very next fight right after that would be in the UK, not the US. I imagine. And as difficult as it may be for Josh to continually make 140 pounds, if he beats Teofimo, he might try to continue to make it because there are bigger fights for him at 140 than there are at 147. There are no titles available for him to fight for at 147. No. Nope. Not right now. At 140, Josh Taylor's got the Lopez fight coming up, a potential rematch with Regis. Maybe you see about getting Devin Haney in the ring if Devin beats Vasil Lomachenko and moves up in weight. Even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't beat Vasil Lomachenko, he still might move up in weight. But at 147, what are Josh Taylor's options? This latest tirade from young Teofimo Lopez may have helped to tip the scales in Tosh Jailer's favor because I don't imagine that either top rank or ESPN are taking kindly to what Teofimo Lopez said. Maybe before they would have preferred that the younger, fresher fighter with more upside and more of a ceiling, maybe they would have preferred to put that title in Teofimo Lopez's hands. But given that Teofimo said this would be his last fight on the platform, now I'm not so sure. Now I'm not so sure the top rank's gonna do him any more favors. I mean, he already tried to backdoor them once, and here he is again, sticking it to them again. The stylistic matchup between the fighters is hard enough to wrap your mind around, but when you think about all this stuff... Teofimo Lopez has only grown more and more imbalanced in the subsequent weeks and months that followed his loss to George Cambosos. He hasn't been the same. You're having this emotional outburst ahead of a very important fight to you, a fight to where the rest of your career is on the other side of it and all the other big fights you can have and you're worried about fighting at the Hulu Theater. You're mad that it's at the Hulu Theater instead of the big room at MSG. This is what you're worried about. This is what you're focused on. Is it me or is history repeating itself? Because ahead of the George Cambosos fight, he didn't have his eyes on the ball either. He was talking about Javante and he was talking about Devin and worrying about all this other stuff instead of worrying about the man that's in front of him. Not a good look. Not encouraging. It was already a hard fight to edge before. This latest outburst from Teofimo communicates instability. Imbalance. Don't worry about where you're fighting. Tosh Jailer. The tartar sauce tornado. It's the tartan tornado. The Spartan Tobago. Just focus on the fact that you're fighting him, that you've got to get past this guy for any of this other stuff to even matter. That's what you should be focused on. It's a recurrent theme with Teofimo Lopez, isn't it? That he's not focused. I fear for this kid if he loses. I do. 